In our mesh object example, we're going to implement flocking. The idea of flocking came from observations of birds in flight, and the conclusion that there was probably no leader and the motion of a flock could be simplified to a few simple rules. It was first suggested at SIGGRAPH 87 in a groundbreaking paper by Craig Reynolds. He called members of the flock voids, a term that has stuck as a common term for an individual member of a computer-simulated flock. Void is short for birdoid object. Once you've scanned the members of the flock that are within a certain user-defined radius and in the line of sight, use these three rules to adjust the position, orientation, and velocity of each void. Rule number one, separation. Steer to avoid crowding other local voids. To achieve this, find the vector that points away from vectors from the current void to other local voids. Do alignment. Steer towards the average heading of local voids. Simply lerp the current heading with the average heading of local voids. Three, cohesion. Steer to move toward the average position of local voids. Find the average position of local voids and steer towards it. If separation and cohesion seem to be opposites of each other, remember that for separation, we're working with vectors from the current void, whereas for cohesion, we are considering the average position of a group of voids in the calculation. Okay, enough theory, time to see a concrete example. Open the scene instance flocking from scenes, compute shaders, instance. And in your IDE, open instance flocking.cs and instance flocking compute from the same folder. We're going to be working with another compute buffer, and for this example, we'll focus mainly on the compute shader. But before we do that, let's quickly review the C-sharp script. A void has a position, direction, and a noise offset value. In this struct, I've added a constructor method, but the data in the struct is only two vector threes and a float. There are a number of public properties that will allow the user to adjust the behavior of the flock. We'll discuss these as they come up when coding the shader. Init voids creates and populates a voids array. Position is a random value inside a sphere. Init shader creates and sets the compute buffer from the voids array and sets a number of properties in the compute shader. The update method sets time and delta time and then dispatches the kernel. Once the compute shader has calculated the new position and direction for each void, we use render mesh indirect to actually render the voids. Render mesh indirect needs a render params instance, a mesh, and a graphics buffer instance. The render params instance is initialized in the start method. Notice that the constructor is passed a material. This material must support instancing. The method we use is to edit the URP lit shader. To do this, we copy the files lit shader, lit forward pass hlsl, and if shadows are supported, shadowcaster pass dot hlsl from the GitHub repo, Unity Technologies, Graphics, Folder Packages, com Unity Render Pipelines, Universal Shaders, and we'll link this below. I recommend putting these files together into a subfolder. The changes to lit shader are minimal. The shader name is changed and the path to lit forward pass HLSL is changed to a single dot, meaning it will use the file in the same folder as this, the lit shader file. In the lit forward pass HLSL file, we define the void struct and the void's buffer. We add a create matrix function. This creates a rotation and position matrix from position, direction, and up vectors. It's important to add a SV instance ID element to the attribute struct. This will allow access to the instance ID in the vertex shader. The lit shader defines the function lit pass vertex as the vertex shader. This function is in the lit forward pass HLSL file for a forward render pipeline. Now that we have an instance ID in the input attributes parameter, we can source an individual void from the void's buffer. We use the create matrix function and the void position and direction to create a matrix. We edit the parameter pass to get vertex position in the default version of this file by multiplying input position OS by the matrix just created. Get vertex position is expecting a float 3, so outside the mul function, we add .xyz to change the float 4 output to a float 3. We do more or less the same for the normal input. Now we have a material to use. Let's look at how to use this to display multiple mesh objects. You may have noticed that we've added an additional buffer to the script, args buffer, a graphics buffer. 
The vertex fragment shader will use this buffer when rendering. You'll need to add the code to initialize the buffer. When creating the buffer, we set the type as indirect arguments, the elements in the array as one, and the size of an element as the size of an indirect draw indexed args. Now we create an array data of a single indirect draw indexed args. We set the index count per instance to the vertex count of the Boyd mesh using the get index count method, and we set the instance count to the num of Boyd's property. Now we can copy the data over to the args buffer using the set data method. Now the data is resident on the GPU. That's everything we need to know about the C-sharp script, so let's switch to the compute shader. Okay, focusing on the flocking code in the compute shader. Remember this involves applying three simple rules, separation, alignment, and cohesion. So first we get the Boyd from the buffer based on IDX. Then we set up the initial separation, alignment, and cohesion values. When calculating these values, we only consider nearby Boyds. Inevitably, the current Boyd is inside this radius, so nearby count starts at one, not zero. Then for every Boyd, we can ignore it if the loop is pointing at the current Boyd. I must not equal ID X to apply the updates. Then we get the Boyd pointed to by the I variable. One more check is the distance from the current Boyd to the temporary Boyd less than the property neighbor distance. The most complex calculation is separation, so we'll come back to this, but first, alignment and cohesion. For alignment, we simply get the sum of each Boyd's direction, and for cohesion, the sum of each Boyd's position, with the cohesion variable starting with the property flock position. Then outside the loop, we calculate the average values for alignment and cohesion by dividing their accumulated values by nearby count. For cohesion, we need to subtract the current Boyd's position and normalize the result. This leaves the target direction as the sum of the three properties. But when applying the newly calculated direction, we only use it at a very low blend with the existing Boyd direction. Now we have a Boyd direction, and remember this is the forward vector, not a rotation value. We can use it to update the position by multiplying it by the speed and delta time. The last step is to apply our updates back to the buffer. If you run the program now, the voids will clump together as we haven't yet applied a separation value. Let's fix that right away. Back in the for loop, we first get a vector from the temporary void to the void we're currently setting and get its length. We use the offset vector and scale this by a value that increases the nearer we are to the void we're setting. Because we use one over distance, we need to make sure distance is never zero. Division by zero is good to avoid, so what does one over distance minus one over neighbor distance mean? Think about what happens when distance is small. One over distance is very large and we can more or less ignore the small value of one over neighbor distance. Whereas if this void is near the limit of neighbor distance, then we get more or less one over neighbor distance minus one over neighbor distance or zero. So when a void is close to the target void, we massively increase the separation vector and when one is near the neighbor distance value, we virtually ignore it. Now you have a flocking example. After a few seconds, all the voids come together and orbit around the flock position. In our final example, we're going to use a skinned mesh. Let's go through that in a small part three. 